Um, let's get into it. Um, we'll just do maybe quick intros first. But uh, I guess for starters, this is going to be our talk discussion presentation on multi-round interactive proofs, uh, how and why. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Daniel Goldman. I'm an engineer here at Off-Chain Labs and also do, uh, oh, I don't know, technical communication, let's just say broadly. Um, um, Ed, you want to give a quick? Sure. Hey, everybody. I'm Ed Felton. I'm a co-founder and chief scientist at Off-Chain Labs. And um, yeah, I do a whole bunch of engineering, some protocol design stuff. Harry. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm Harry. I'm uh, also a co-founder of Off-Chain Labs and uh, CTO and uh, do a whole, whole lot of engineering. <laughs> um, cool. So I guess to get started, for a bit of context, um, uh, we did uh, a Q&A session last week. And we got a series of questions um, from, uh, from, our, uh, from Eric Wall that were very um, focused on sort of the benefits of multi-round proof, uh, multi-round proofs for optimistic rollups versus sort of single round. Um, and we'll get into some of the specifics of those questions in a second. Um, but basically, what you know, from sort of thinking about it, um, we want to get into this question, but it's sort of impossible to answer that without getting much deeper into uh, the sort of core arbitrum protocol design. Um, and it's the more I thought about it, I thought this takes you know an entire session just to do. So here we are. Um, the um, I think the the sort of key takeaway here that we're going to see is that um, you know when you talk about this distinction between our system, Arbitrum, and something like Optimism, the sort of surface level comparison is what I said. So uh, fraud proofs are handled via this interactive process versus via a single round. Um, that um um oh Harry's dad is here. <laughs> that's cool. Um sorry. Um, um so that's kind of um in a way that is a bit of a red herring. I mean it's true that that is a difference, but it actually sort of is just the the starting point or the entry point to a much deeper difference in how these protocols handle um emulating a virtual machine on layer two. And essentially what what we'll sort of see is that the arbitrary way of doing things involves full virtualization of a virtual machine. Whereas the optimism way of doing things involves the ability to sort of containerize and emulate a virtual mach machine on layer one. And if it's not clear what I mean by that, hopefully by the end, it'll at least be clearer. Um, but um, what I, <laughs> um, I'm just, yeah, I see what you're doing there in chat. Um, um, but uh, I lost my train of thought, what was I saying? Yeah, so the idea is like, um, what you'll see is as we sort of unpack that distinction is that these design decisions are actually very different. Um, and in terms of where complexity emerges in, in both of the protocols and the sort of implications there, there's a lot of like surprising, weird, and I think kind of interesting uh, interesting design differences that we will, that we will get into. Um, so um, anything else to add there, Harry, before we like dive in? Um. I mean, I think that I think that pretty well covered it. I mean, I think you know this is this should be an interesting session because I feel like you know, you know, we you know we we've been we've been you know building this stuff for for you know years now. The the uh, you know the optimism team has been working on their stuff for for you know not not quite as long, but for for quite a while now. But you know we've been like you know and and you know obviously like you know we're we're you know pretty familiar with what they're doing. They're pretty familiar with what we're doing, but we haven't kind of like had much in the way of sort of like direct and people haven't done much in the way of kind of direct comparison. And, you know, we, we've kind of haven't done, uh, you know, we haven't wanted to do too much of it ourselves just because like, you know, everybody's, you know, focused on building it. But like, you know, I think the question comes up a lot. So I think it should be pretty interesting uh, to, uh, to, you know, talk about it a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And um, one, one other thing I wanted to add, um, if you do, if anyone, um, uh, if anyone listening um, has questions, feel free to um, ask questions in the chat. Um, for this, you know, sometimes we do more open-ended Q and A's, but for this one, we do want to focus on sort of this topic at hand. So questions around, uh, basically around this, are the ones we'll take. If you have something else, you know, we'll probably get to it at some other point. But um, okay, let's let's sort of get started. So um, I guess first things first. Um, so if you're at all familiar with like optimistic rollup, which you probably are if you're here, um, the thing that you probably know is that the basic idea is that instead of sort of doing all this work is that we have some transactions that are taking place on layer two. 
which means that instead of doing the work that we usually do on layer one of directly verifying them and ensuring that they're valid, we sort of optimistically assume they're valid. And then if there's any disagreement, we can sort of adjudicate that back on layer one and sort of prove fraud. Um, so what we want to start getting into is the question of, well, how exactly? How do we prove fraud? So as we said, in the case of Arbitrum, this is sort of a multi-round interactive game. Um, and yeah, let's start by just sort of describing that, uh, this question of like literally what, you know, how does the Arbitrum protocol actually handle, um, handle proving fraud? Um, so yeah, I'll open yeah. it up. I'll open it up to Ed to get us, to get us started there. Hey everybody. Um, yeah. So let me first set up this scenario. So here's the scenario. Um, a lot of people have submitted transactions to an Arbitrum chain. Um, and those have been put in batches into the chain's inbox. And now Alice is going to make a roll-up block, we sometimes call an assertion, which is claiming what the result of the, of the next group of transactions will be. And so let's claim that, let's assume that Alice's um, roll-up block that she claims um, covers a thousand transactions and 10 billion steps of computation altogether. Okay, um, so that's uh, 10 to the 10. Uh, steps of computation. So Alice posts um, her claimed rollup block, and it says, "Okay, the machine is going. The virtual machine is going to execute 10 to the 10 instructions, and at the result of it, here's what the state root will be—a sort of hash that covers all of the state of the um, of the virtual machine. And then she also makes a claim about what outputs it produces, like which withdrawals happen from the chain, and uh, and, and and stuff like that. Okay." So Alice has made this claim. And then, of course, there's a window of time where someone else can show up and disagree with it. So in our story, we'll say that Bob decides to dispute Alice's claim. So um, Bob says, no, I disagree with Alice's claim. Um, I say the result of executing 10 billion steps of computation starting in the same state as Alice is something else. So Bob makes his specific claim about what he thinks the result should be. Um, and now um, we get to what really the crucial step, which is um, bisection. So Bob, in addition to saying, here's what the result is after uh, 10 to the 10 steps, the full sort of the full claim that Alice has made. Um, now he says, now he has to break that up into a hundred pieces that are one one hundredth as large. So he posts the difference after 10 to the eight, two times 10 to the eight, three times 10 to the eight. He posts what the state root is at each of those points. Okay, so what he's doing is he's taking his 10 to the 10 step assertion, he's breaking it into 100 assertions, which are each one 100th as large. Now, Alice, um, now the ball is back in Alice's court. Bob has made a claim that's different from Alice's and he has, uh, he has dissected it in, into 100 pieces. Now, what Alice has to do next is she has to point to one of those hundred pieces that she says is wrong. If she disagrees with Bob, there must be something Bob's claiming that she disagrees with. And so she picks one of those intervals, the size 10 to the eight, and, um, or uh, um, I guess 100 million, and she says, I disagree with that one. And now Alice has to say in her response what she thinks is the correct result. Instead, after, uh, at the end of that little 10 to the eight size chunk, and then she has to break that into 100 um, sub pieces, each of them 10 to the six or a million steps in length, right? Once Alice has done that, now the ball's back in Bob's court, he's got to pick one of Alice's 100 smaller claims and dispute that. And then he in turn makes a counterclaim, divides that 100 ways and so on. So each time a player moves in the game, they first of all say what they think is the right answer, which has to be different from what the other person said. And then they break their claim into 100 pieces. So, um, so you go down to a disagreement. So what you're doing is ev in every round of this game, you're reducing the size of the execution that they disagree about by a factor of 100. So after five rounds of this, you're down to a disagreement about one step of execution, like say just an add instruction. So if Alice and Bob have narrowed their disagreement down to a single instruction, now, uh, let's say that it's, uh, it's Alice's, Alice is making a claim about what the result of that one step of execution is. Now, Alice needs to actually prove what the result of that one step is. We call that a one-step proof. And that, 
um, and that actually gets checked. Okay, so it's a back and forth process between Alice and Bob. It's like a two-player game, and there's a referee in the game. The referee is an L1 Ethereum contract, which is part of, of, of Arbitrum. And that referee makes sure that each player, when it's their turn to disagree with the other player and then subdivide, actually does disagree and does provide 100, um, 100 uh, claims about what the inter uh, smaller intermediate steps are. And then at the very end, when there's a disagreement about one step of execution, then the referee just checks whether that one step is correct. So if the step is an add instruction, then Alice, you know, that adds the top two items on the stack, on the machine stack, then Alice needs to uh, say, okay, here's what the top two items on the stack are at this point, and here's my proof of that. It's an add instruction, and here's my proof of that. And then the result of adding those things is whatever it is, right? So it's, it's by section or dissection by about a factor of 100 at each round and then a one-step proof back and forth between Alice and Bob. So this is a very efficient way of uh, resolving the dispute because the referee's job is super simple. Did Alice move or Bob move on time? Did they make a claim about the other, did, when they contradicted the other person's uh, claim, did they make a claim that was different? And um, did they in fact uh, produce um, 99 intermediate points like they were supposed to? And then only at the very end does the referee actually need to look at anything about uh, what the machine does on the merits. So anyway, that's yeah. how Arbitrum does it, um, by section followed by a one-step proof. Yeah, so just to like reiterate a bit, I think like the key intuition here, at least for me, um, is that you know if Alice and Bob disagree about the result of the state update, it must be that there's a single instruction, at least one instruction that they also disagree on. And basically this whole interactive process is mostly the whole thing is about just zeroing in on what that little tiny disagreement is. Um, and that process of zeroing in doesn't actually, you know, you're not actually doing any of this L2 execution until you actually find the one step and then you just execute that one step. Um, yep. And in that way, the sort of L2 virtual machine um, is something that like the base layer doesn't have to do that much work on. It just has to do this actual bisection or I guess dissection. Um, and then it just needs the ability to execute a single um, AVM instruction. Yeah, so two things, yeah, so two things about that. One is, right, first this idea that Alice and Bob are doing the work to figure out what is the first instruction of execution where they disagree. Um, that is, um, that's obviously an important thing. And the other thing is that, like, the technical property that makes this thing work, um, which is pretty easy to prove to yourself, is that um, the party who is right can always win the game. Uh, can always win this process. A party who makes a correct assertion can force the other claim, can force the other party to make always make false claims. And so if you're right, you can always win this dispute. Um, and this right. is what leads to the global property of Arbitrum that one party who's telling the truth can force the correct execution even if everyone else in the world is against them. Because that one party, by virtue of being right, can actually win this, uh, win any dispute they get into. Yeah, because if you're right, actually every individual step is right. So wherever you end up in this bisection or dissection, you end up being able to pass the one step proof. So yeah, just yeah. be one one and honest party. party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So if and if and if you're right, then the other party, um, they're forced. The rules of the game say they have to disagree with you, and so when they disagree with you, they'll be wrong, which means you can always rebut them with something that's correct, right? And so if you're right, you can always win the game, and it's pretty easy. All you have to do is tell the truth. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of like the benefits of doing it this way, uh, and this is sort of um, you know, there's no easy way to like summarize this. It's probably a lot of what we'll be talking about. Um, but um, the first thing is again, it's 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 good to just sort of understand that this process, in terms of what layer one actually needs to do, is actually in a way surprisingly simple. Um, the other, so one of the questions that that we got asked is 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 um this issue of state root commitment. So um, where uh, on something like Arbitrum, we don't need to sort of commit to as many state roots in the optimistic happy case um, as they do on optimism. Um, and this is this is fairly straightforward, um, where essentially, I think the way, the way Harry likes to put it is we sort of, um, with a single round proof version, the, the sort of state transitions are pre-bisected. So even in the happy case, you post all of these state roots, whereas in our case, we sort of bisect in real time and post state roots as need be. So instead of having like every state transition be a single transaction 
and having state roots for each transaction on chain, we can just sort of say a bunch of transactions. We consider one big state update, and then we only do this extra work if challenge arises. Um, so that's like one benefit, <laughs> um, where essentially like, OK, we don't need as much data on chain. We don't need to like serialize state as often, save some gas, you know, yay. Um, but again, that's that, that that's sort of like the most uh, the most surface level benefit to this. Um, where it gets, I think, more interesting is when we sort of compare uh, the sort of you know the pessimistic case, the unhappy case, where we have to do this front proof, which I just described, um, to sort of the alternative if you're committed to resolving um, resolving a dispute in a single transaction, um, a single round round fraud proof like Optimism does. So. What happens there, if we sort of sh shift gears to the single version of things, which we don't do on our um, So again, what this kind of looks like is, OK, you have a transaction um, um, which says, OK, here's, you know, here's the old state. I'm declaring that this is the new state at the end of the transaction. And let's say that that state transition is invalid. So again, Alice and Bob kind of disagree. So Alice uh, was dishonest. Um, Bob now has to prove that Alice was dishonest in, in a single transaction. OK, so the basic idea is what you do is you just execute that transaction on L1, right? Um, um, but what does that entail? Um, so in the sort of single round optimism model, that entails a few things. So first of all, um, in order to actually do this execution, uh, the transaction is going to sort of depend on a number of things. So a transaction um, you know, depends on some data on chain, which is to say that you, know, you have to load some data from contract storage, let's say. So any sort of dependency of this transaction, anything that is that any bit of the state that it touches, you have to actually post that state on chain um, and do these Merkle proofs showing that it's included in the kind of pre state. Um, so that's number one. Um, any contract that the transaction uses has to be deployed um, on the L1 in real time. Um, and then of course you have to do the actual execution um, of the whole transaction. And then kind of in the post state, so any, any, um, any storage slots that get updated, you also do Merkle proofs of those against the post state. Um, and, then you sort of use the, and then you sort of generate the post state root via all those updates, OK? So the point is, um, there's all these stuff that has to happen. Um, and all of that stuff, of course, is going to take gas. Um, this is, I think, one of the questions that, that he sort of focused on, is if there's any cases where like, you know, a single round prod proof could end up taking a lot of gas. And yeah, I mean, you can imagine, right? I mean, it's uh, we're talking about generalized Ethereum style computation. So if you think of like, I don't know, some crazy flash loan style transaction, um, you're touching a bunch of contracts, you're updating a lot of state. You do have to sort of start thinking about this this, this issue of okay, what if um, what if we get to the point where the fraud proof is so expensive it can't fit in an L1 block, uh, which would obviously be a serious problem. So um, to handle that, um, Optimism has this. Um, they have this nice term they call it, I think, nuisance gas. We're basically within the L2, even in the optimistic case, they kind of have to keep track of how much a fraud proof would cost just in case they have to do it, right? And again, keeping track of how much a fraud proof would cost is keeping track of all the stuff I just mentioned. It's not just a matter of execution. It's a matter of all of these Merkle proofs of all the state. It's deploying contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, um, so that's another thing that kind of has to happen. Um, just to make sure there is this other way of doing it. And here's where like, I don't want to, you know, not sure what exactly, uh, not sure exactly what they've committed to in terms of their approach. Um, um, but in theory, you, you could also, um, if you want to avoid have doing all this work in one transaction, you could split it up into multiple transactions, um, where essentially you have like, you declare, you know, Bob declares fraud, and then you post these bits of data, uh, sort of individually in separate transactions. But, um, I mean, at the very least, if you do that, it's no longer really a single round. Um, and then I would just say that raises a number of other questions. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know if Optimism is doing is, is planning on doing things that way. But that is sort of another approach there. Well, um, it's, it's yeah, it, it's quite difficult because you have to have some way of sort of serializing or merkelizing the full the full state of the machine um, between these transactions, right? Essentially, you have to save and restore your state or um, you need to you need to compute a hash of the full state of the system in the middle of executing a uh, a transaction, which is not easy. Yeah, so there's that there's the well, dimensional you step. You don't split the you don't split the execution part into multiple parts. You have like a pre you have a before you start execution where you like supply do a bunch of a ton of transactions to supply all of the state. Like you can't. Right. You need to be able to execute like the 
actual execution in a single transaction for sure. Right, the execution, right. The other, but the other parts of like posting all of these, like, you know, these data dependencies, you could maybe in theory split up. Um, there, there, but, there was, yeah. I, this is like way off topic. There was like an ETH research <laughs> proposal, which Daniel, you're probably aware of. I forget what it was called, where it was actually like doing like, so they were, they, they were actually going to attempt to do like, be, be able to prove a transaction over multiple rounds. Uh, yes. Over multiple trans over multiple like L one transactions. I don't know if that ever went anywhere. Yeah, yeah, and no, I do know what you're talking about. That was some other optimistic wall up project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right. Oh, I, I should I should know this. It was like it was one with a, like an anon uh, founder. I think like yeah. Like, I'm blanking yeah. on the name now. Maybe maybe Ben. Maybe ben <laughs> I'm looking at Ben. Ben, your help. Um, a little digression, um, but but yeah, no, that's right. That was that was part of the approach. Is it, yeah, there was there was a whole post explaining that design architecture, which yeah, essentially like yeah, a bit off topic, but long story short, has its own complexities. Um, the other thing, of course, here is so we haven't even talked about the execution itself, and maybe maybe here if you want to spin here, but basically like, um, uh, well, yeah, there's this there's this whole other component of actually handling sort of EVM execution that takes place on layer two and re-executing it on layer one. Um, that you have to sort of worry about if you're doing if you're doing single round fraud proof stuff. You want to, um, uh, you know, essentially. Long story short, here is there's this other component called a safety checker. Um, I can I can maybe start it. Maybe Harry, you step in in case I say something wrong. But <laughs> but essentially, um, what 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 you basically have to do if you're like re-executing the EVM on L, uh, you know, executing something EVM like on L2 and then re-executing it on L1. Um, is any any operation that's context dependent? Um, you can't literally reuse the same EVM operation. So in other words, you know, uh, an operation that is not context dependent is like one plus one. It doesn't matter where you execute that; you're still getting the same result. If you're loading data, if you're loading contract data from storage, or you know, checking an account balance, um, doing that on L2 and then re-executing it on L1 obviously has to work differently because now you're in a different context. So in order to like get this execution and have it be deterministic, there's this um, there's this interception that optimism has to do, where they kind of intercept all of these operations um, and uh, all, all of these particular context dependent EVM operations and kind of replace them with their OVM equivalent. Um, and this basically happens at compile time uh, when they compile contracts. They they have their own fork of this Lindley compiler, which they did surgery on to do to sort of do what I just described. Um, um, does that seem like a fair summary, Perry? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, just like zooming out slightly, like the reason why the 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 like the thing about optimistic rollups is that you have to be able to like so we're we're like, you know, currently we're in the present and we're running a transaction and we're saying what the result of that is. And then when we prove it, we have to make sure that if it's valid now, then it'll be valid when we prove it. And if it's invalid now, it'll be invalid when we prove it. And and maintaining that is is really really important because otherwise you could have kind of otherwise the whole protocol is broken basically. And so like how you kind of achieve that property of like your the proof kind of not being related to any external state is kind of you know relatively straightforward for for um. For the kind of approach that we take, where kind of you're you're just um, emulating, whereas for the for the approach of kind of like containerizing, where you actually have to have like untrusted user code running on Ethereum as part of the fraud proof process, while guaranteeing that that code will run um, the same way at like as at a later point as it does now, is like trick is kind of you know tricky basically and and the way the only way to achieve that is by kind of severely constraining um at the like evm level what sorts of code appears in it um and, and kind of being able to do that yeah is kind of the 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 tricky process um which involves kind of making modifying the compiler in order to kind of output code of a very specific format that can be known to not cause trouble with proofs. Um. Yeah, and that again, with them, that happens on the level of their, their fork of the compiler, um, which, I mean, we'll talk more about this later, but in our case, we, we can just sort of use the Solidity compiler as is, and then we compile the VM code. Um, so it's sort of a post, um, 
post compilation step. But yeah, we'll get we'll get more to that. But yeah, I mean, the sort of punchline with 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 a lot of this stuff is all of those, those so like those particular complexities, those particular design complexities. Um, one of the exciting things about I think the the arbitrum design is. We just kind of avoid all of this. Um, we don't really have to think about any of those things that I just mentioned. Um, um, as Harry described, it's like this idea of worrying about you know which operations are context specific and which aren't on Arbitrum is much more trivial because ultimately all we're doing is executing a one-step proof, and if that requires a bit of context, we just give a bit of context. Uh, but we don't have to do any sort of like compiler surgery to get there. Um, in terms of this notion of like yeah yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say I think the. The the biggest and, and just you know talking about it now like the, the 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 easiest way to I think describe like the huge difference here is basically in our like the a dispute in Arbitrum is resolved only running like smart like a you know smart contract code that like is kind of global over the chain so like there's nothing kind of specific to what's mm. being disputed in terms of like the contract code that's executed. Like there are, you know, function calls and like the input to those functions is obviously related to the thing being disputed. But like the actual code run is just like a single or it's a couple contracts that like are, you know, are 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 audited and work. As opposed to basically having to have end user submitted code run as part of the fraud proof process. Um, which is yeah, is is is, is tricky <laughs> to get right. Um, is very very tricky to get right. And it really yeah. expands the attack surface. Yeah, because like you know, for anybody who's a Solidity developer, like you know that like generally speaking, calling into untrusted code is really really difficult to get right in the EVM because the EVM is not particularly nice to use when it comes to these kind of trust issues like you know your code you you write your contract your contract internally you know works fine but the second your contract has to call make a call to another contract it gets real it gets kind of significantly more complicated yeah um and in terms of like gas as far as ensuring that we'll be able to actually execute this on l1 on arbitrum uh, you know, I mentioned that with optimism there's this this complexity of this like nuisance gas tracking on arbitrum it's it's it just um, it's just fairly trivial. It follows directly from um, the way the fraud proof process works. That you know, each individual transaction um, that is required for an interactive fraud, uh, fraud proof, excuse me, <clears throat> um, has a clear upper bound, right? So there's basically these bisection steps, which all kind of look similar. Um, we sort of know how much gas those will take, and then in terms of like the one step proof at the end, some of those take you know those take a different amount of gas. But we can just look at like the most expensive one, and it's still like well below. Uh, uh, it's well below the gas limit of a single block, so so there's no th there's no additional calculation there to ensure that we'll be able to get this in in on on L1. So that's also nice. Um, so um, yeah, so we get all these nice. We sort of get to avoid these particular complexities in um, in a very nice way. Um, um, okay, talk about downside. <laughs> um, um, so downside to the multi round approach, and I think like there's kind of it. There's kind of just one. <laughs> In a way, not that there's only one downside, but there's one that like sticks out, um, which is essentially. Um, Wait, and this I, th is, I thought I thought it was yeah. perfect. No, I'm just kidding. It's it's near perfect, <laughs> and even downside is hardly one. But um, so essentially, one of the um, this, this is a bit hard to. I'm trying to think of the clearest way to to explain this, but basically, like the the basic assumption that we have with arbitrum is that if there is one honest validator that honest party will be able to sort of gear things towards the truth yeah um and that's the same security assumption that something like optimism makes right if there's one honest validator they'll be able to issue fraud proof for a given round of dispute the sort of um dispute process that ed was describing there is this possible case where both parties are being dishonest right so neither side is actually like bisecting you know is 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 sort of carrying out the protocol in an honest way uh, maybe it's like the same person, just like wearing two different hats, um, trying to just confuse and screw up the whole thing. So what we need to allow for um, is the possibility, uh, we need to allow for the possibility of this and say that, okay, after a given sort of, uh, you know, a bisection and one step proof process happens, we need to sort of give the opportunity to challenge again, right? So essentially this challenge process can be extended and we have to allow for that, okay? Um, and that, in, you know, in and of itself is a downside. Now, um, with that said, it really isn't, uh, for all sorts of reasons, it's not really the downside that it appears to be. 
Um, so there's a few things to say here. I guess like number one is, so the idea here is if someone's gonna do this, right, they're gonna sort of slow things down and deliberately extend challenge. Um, um, first of all, doing this is gonna be very costly for them. Um, so for every round that they lose, they're going to lose stake. And if you extend a given challenge multiple times, the amount of stake required increases. So with each round, you're going to lose more stake. Um, so literally, at a certain point, they're just going to run out of ether. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's just and that is just sort of guaranteed by the protocol. Um, um, and the, uh, yeah, and just to amplify that, and it's not just that it costs them a linear amount that's linear in how much how long they delay. The cost of of this sort of delay attack is exponential in the length of delay that someone is causing. Um, because they either have to come in with a lot of false stakes um, so that uh, their people sort of pair up and challenge each other, or else um, if the system stalls, then the required stake goes up. And so either way, it's um, exponentially expensive to delay for some length of time. Yeah. Um... So, so that's the first thing. The other thing is like, okay, let's say you're doing this quote unquote delay, what are you actually delaying? And I think an important like aha moment with the arbitration protocol for me when I was first learning about it is even as a challenge is going on, in terms of what happens on L2, um, uh, like L2 only interactions, let's say, the chain can just keep going, right? Um, and this is essentially just like a direct consequence of the properties of rollups where as a dispute is going on, any oddest party can see, okay, you know, Who's, who's gonna win the dispute? What is the sort of, what is the valid assertion? What is the honest side? And they can just keep making assertions there. So this sort of, um, the, the sort of state updates kind of splits into this tree. You have this invalid stuff going on. We say, we don't care. We know that's gonna get overturned. We'll just keep building on the valid side. Um, and that's really cool. Cause that means that, yeah, as far as like a user just using like, you know, in exchange or whatever on L2, they don't really have to be concerned with the fact that there's dispute going on. Um, which is which is super cool, and I think that's kind of the most important thing to say here. Um, but okay, like it does delay something, right? And basically, the only thing that gets delayed are um, L2 to L1 messages, which is to say anything that's going on on the Arbitrum chain that kind of in turn goes back and affects Layer One. Um, and so, if there's a dispute going on, right? Layer One just by necessity, it's sort of um, the whole point of Layer Two is that Layer One can't directly know what's going on on Layer Two. Um, it's kind of where we get our scalability. Which means that, OK, layer one has to just say, OK, we have to wait for this dispute to resolve before we make any updates that are sort of coming directly from Arbitrum. Um, with that said, even, you know, even with that caveat, OK, what's the most sort of um, important and useful and common L2 to L1 update? It's probably withdrawing, withdrawing Ether or withdrawing some token. And if what you're withdrawing is a fungible asset, you know, we can use all of these sort of fast exit atomic swap techniques that uh, you know, we've included in, in, in our documentation, um, what we call like liquidity exits sometimes. So these are just like general techniques that are used, you know, other layer two protocols use these, these sorts of things where you don't have to directly wait for a dispute route. You can have a liquidity provider kind of help you out and swap your tokens out from layer two to layer one. And the nice thing is, even in the middle of a dispute process, those still work. And those still work just the same way. And they work for the same reason, right? Because even while dispute is happening, any liquidity provider can sort of get this subjective perspective and say, OK, I can see that this is, I can see which way this is going to resolve. Um, I can see that this is a valid withdrawal. I'm willing to provide you liquidity now. And our general hope, and I would say actually our expectation, is that even in general, you know, regardless of a dispute happening or whatever, this will just be like the default way people withdraw from from, from Arbitrum to Ethereum um, is 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 with these is with these fast withdrawal techniques. Um, in which case, so even in that case, even if there is some weird extended dispute going on, uh, if you have these liquidity providers giving you liquidity, you don't even have to sort of wait. Um, so yeah, what it, what what is you know a material difference and is something of a downside. I think practically is unlikely to really matter, which is nice. Um, um, cool. OK. Um, so what else? Moving on. Yeah. Oh, so um, the, the sort of last question that we got um, directly from Eric anyway, which I like this question a lot, um, is he asked, putting, um, I'm, I'm just going to read his question because I like the way he asked it. Um, putting the pure theoretics aside for a minute, have you noticed any perhaps counterintuitive or surprising second order effects with respect to tooling, UX quirks that differ greatly depending on subtle design differences? between ORU design? Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, 
Uh, as far as counterintuitive or surprising, you know, maybe more surprising to me than uh, some of the other founders because I've been thinking about this stuff longer. Um, but um, there are like interesting benefits to doing this uh, this multi route ritualization approach that have, um, yeah, that show up. Uh, that certainly I didn't expect when I first learned the call. Um, um, let's bring in Harry. I feel like I've been talking for a while, but do you want to? Um, yeah, um, happy wanna, to. Yeah, take it, take it away. Uh, there's a number of things here. So whatever well, you yeah, but, but you said it was surprising benefits and so nothing. Right. Just, just <laughs> none of it surprised uh, Harry, right. but things that may have surprised me. <laughs> you, you forgot to say boo if you wanted me to be surprised. No. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, it, it's it's an interesting question, and, it, and it's like it, it comes down to kind of like you know, it, it leads back around to where we started, like the you know, kind of. The the obvious benefit was the was the kind of not needing to do these inter intermediate state routes, and so having this kind of like having kind of at this like base layer being more optimistic, and like you know in that kind of the the optimistic case can be can be cheaper. Um, but you know I I'm, I'm much I think much more exciting is kind of like some of the some of the compatibility benefits. Um, and so kind of the, I think the one that like is, is kind of the, the, the thing that Arbitrum does very nicely, um, is kind of make the user experience very, um, very similar to, um, Ethereum that have the kind of, to have an absolutely totally minimized, um, difference between kind of what it's like to develop an Arbitrum on, on, and to the degree of being able to take Ethereum code that worked on Ethereum and just port it and, and deploy it and have it work in kind of no time at all. The biggest thing there probably um, is native ETH support, is that kind of on, on Arbitrum, ETH is the, the same ETH that's a native asset on Ethereum, um, is, is ETH as a native asset on Arbitrum. Um, and so kind of all of the code, all of all of contract code um, that kind of support, that uses like payable and, and receive and any of that stuff, um, just, just yeah. works out of the box, um, which I think is pretty damn valuable in terms of kind of being able to provide kind of this this quality, which is you can just deploy your contracts since there is obviously kind of a lot of like you know because of the benefits that that Ethereum gave to Ether on the on the base layer, it's kind of a very fun uh, you know it, it has a very fundamental role um, that that just kind of it doesn't. You know, having treating it as an ERC twenty just kind of is is you know doesn't give it kind of the same status um, as as kind of people expect it to have and as it has um, on on layer one. Um, there's a whole different discussion about whether or not that was a good thing or not to kind of give Ether special status, but I mean, I, you know, that's that's a very different conversation um, since this is really more about kind of like compatibility um, as, as a benefit. Um, the um, the others. Um, the fact that kind of the, the contract size limit um, that Arbitrum, because basically we never need to, because basically if you deploy your contract on Arbitrum, the contract never needs to be executed on Ethereum. Ethereum's contract size limit doesn't affect us at all. Um, that kind of, there's no, there's no limitation from Ethereum on, on kind of how big, how, how many bytes your contract can be. Um, like there would be, if you had to actually deploy and execute that contract um, on um, on on layer one, um, like in in kind of Optimism's uh, containerization approach, um, so that's that's definitely one. Yeah. Um, and in the, in the in the containerization approach, you actually have a slightly smaller contract size limit, um, which I think is just because because they have to run it through their custom compiler. The output EV, yeah, uh, EV, yeah. the output EVM code is like slightly bigger. Yeah, so it's, it's just kind of yeah. So, but in yeah, our case, we go so the that, other direction. That's another case where kind of like you know, I think the, the, there's a really nice advantage to like if it deploys on Ethereum, then it will deploy on Arbitrum. Because um, like I don't know about like anybody listening, but I'll say you know, and and this is just in, in the Arbitrum code base itself. Even like there are a number of L of L1 contracts that are pretty damn near the size limit. Um, and it'll like periodically go over and then I'll do some refactoring in order to get it back under. Um, and I think that that's pretty common among Ethereum developers, um, just because the contract size limit isn't that high. Um, so that's like a pretty significant class of contracts basically that like, you know, will just work out of the box on, on Arbitrum that would, that would run into trouble, um, kind of because of those limits on, uh, on optimism, uh, because of the overhead, which is, which is interesting. 
Yeah. Um, there was a question from, um, it's very confusing because several people have named themselves <laughs> after me. <laughs> but I know that. Daniel Goldman. Which Daniel Goldman? From Daniel Techcoms Goldman, which my understanding is Angela. Um, uh, or no, wait, hold on. Daniel Techcoms Goldman is, I'm so confused. The question I wanted to get at was the one for Angela, whatever, whatever she named herself at the time, which is like basically, you know, what's the, what's the connection between multi-round fraud proofs and like this ETH compatibility thing? And what I would say here is like, I mean, what we can say is that, you know, supporting ETH compatibility on Arbitrum was, you know, was fairly trivial, right? Uh, we can just do it. I'm not exactly sure why this was harder on Optimism, um, but um, they currently don't support it at least. So th presumably there was some, some additional complication there. Um, yeah, I'd have to, I mean, it seems like, yeah, I don't know where exactly that complexity came in. Um, there's, there's a really yeah. core trade-off here, which is like really interesting. And like a lot of things like skirt around it. A lot of like what they, what they, you know, when they talk about this, they skirt around it, we skirt around it, which is basically kind of like where you're maintaining compatibility. So like the optimism team, like fo is focused a lot on like minimizing the number of like software differences in the backend stack. So like, you know, I, I know that, you know, they, they, you know, they, they're, they're kind of node is a modified version of Geth. Um, at the cost of kind of decreasing their level of compatibility with kind of client side tooling and with the EVM. Whereas we kind of make the opposite trade off. Whereas kind of we, we have like a lot of cost, custom software on the back end, uh, but very, very aggressively maintain compatibility on the kind of user facing side um, with, with, um, with, with Ethereum. Um, and so the, and kind of the, the, the reason, the, and, and all of that kind of goes deeply in line with kind of the, the same interactive, like multi-round versus single round thing. Um, because doing multi-round requires a lot more um, engineering. Um, and, and, you know, and, and it, you know, it, it's, it's taken some time to get there. We're there now, but it definitely took a lot of effort. Um, compared to kind of single round, all of the complexity or most, almost all of the complexity is like in the smart contract system uh, uh, that runs on Ethereum. Um, and kind of all of the other parts are relatively simple and that part's really complicated. But that part is exactly kind of what constrains um, what level of compatibility it's able to reach with Ethereum. Whereas kind of, we don't, whereas Arbitrum doesn't really have any, any kind of noticeable constraints on kind of how compatible it can be or things that prevent that. Yeah, so the bumper sticker version of this is <laughs> basically our team deals with custom stuff so you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, I like that. We should make that bumper sticker. Um, um. And another good example of that is just the last thing I was gonna say there, which is um, language compatibility. Because like Arbitrum doesn't have any, we don't need to have any sort of custom compiler. Um, actually, when you deploy your contract to Arbitrum, the the L2 itself goes through a compilation phase. I'm not going to get into the details here of that, but like essentially, the important thing is it's something you can totally ignore and don't need to think about it at all. Um, and so that means basically that any compiler that can compile for Ethereum, the output of that can also be deployed to Arbitrum. Um, and, and so kind of we get the advantage basically of like the second a new Solidity version is released, you can immediately use it with Arbitrum or, you know, the set or, you know, you can use, you know, Viper or um, Yule. Yule Plus or Yule Plus, uh, whatever the thing Adler is working on. Yeah. Even like some, if some new language emerges that we, you know, doesn't even exist yet, if it compiles down to EVM code. Whatever one the EF is like sponsoring development now that's like forked from Viper or like Viper-like, I don't yeah. remember the name of that one, but yeah, <laughs> whatever, whatever language. <laughs> Yeah, um, so that's neat. Uh, in terms of UX, that's obviously nice that we can support more languages. Although, although I think personally, I'd say like the Solidity version one it might even be the bigger deal, like using being able to use any version of the Solidity compiler. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. When a for sure. release comes out, you can immediately start using that with Arbitrum. There's no need to wait. Yeah, and also it's just nice. This is less important, but in terms of tooling, it is just nice that like if you have you know whatever your contract deployment setup is, you can just point it to an Arbitrum node and it just works. You don't have to like intercept it first with some custom compiler thing, which is just cool. Um, so you can just like use Truffle or Hardhat. Um, so yeah, those are some those are some of like nice UX games that that appeared. Um, but, but I think it, it's interesting. It really is surprising, like to get like that, like the degree to which like 
those benefits are like intertwined into the single round versus multi-round thing. Like there's a really, like, it, 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 because, and it's really kind of, kind of, it's kind of nuts, like how many far reaching effects that has. The other thing to, to say is that like, the uh, the point this is like a little, you know kind of back to an earlier conversation but like in terms of like single round versus multi round and like virtualization versus containerization you could do a you could do containerization with with multi round you could do kind of like the the um mm. you could do that with multi with with multi round but you can't do virtualization with single round you right. can only do virtualization with something which is like very 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 evm like right. because it's way more expensive to actually run like a huge, you can't emulate a huge number of instructions. You can only emulate kind of a relatively limited number of instructions. Um, right. You can only containerize so, something that's EVM like, right? Is that what you? Yeah, exactly. And so yeah. kind of being yeah. being like doing taking the containerization approach basically kind of like locks you in to being really, really, really EVM like. Um, yeah. Which yeah. Which again, like you said earlier, I think in terms of. Yeah, this this idea of like where the complexity comes into the system, it's like okay, we have we have this custom VM, so you have to like go through the work of creating that, um, and then yeah, once you sort of cross that bridge, uh, so to speak, um, every like compatibility suddenly becomes a lot easier, which is which is neat. and yeah, those are those are a number of examples that that, that we hit on there. I want to just get at there was another question. Okay, I think this was from Daniel Techcoms Goldman, which is Ben. Um, <laughs> um, but asking basically, so, um, so to dispute, you have to stake, and the answer there is yes. No, that's that's angelfish. Ugh, you, you know what? Like, whatever. From, from Daniel Gold, from one of my proxies, um, <laughs> there was um, this. Uh, yeah. So the question that I see somewhere is, so to dispute, you have to stake, um, and the answer there is yes. Um, the sort of reason for that, I mean, in some respect, like you can imagine a version of the arbitrum protocol that didn't require staking, where you could just like challenge, and you could. Uh, propose blocks and challenge without having to stake, it would like almost work <laughs> in a way, like in the sense that the, the challenge protocol would still work, you would still enforce safety. The problem is now what's to prevent somebody from just griefing the network by doing a bunch of like BS challenges. Um, and basically there's something preventing them, which is they're wasting fees, but we would rather have a stronger disincentive, which is once you lose, you get slashed. Also, um, because it's interactive, right, you're forcing someone else to step in and do their own transactions. Um, we would like to reimburse we would like to incentivize and reimburse that behavior. Um, so we reimburse the gas cost, and then some. We reward you for sort of winning a challenge, so this incentivizes challenges. Um, so those are kind of the reasons that yeah, you need stake to participate. Although to be clear, it's not like you. It's not like you need to be. First of all, what you're staking is ether, um, and it's not like you need to be pre-staked or something like that. Um, you can just sort of sit there silently and have ether ready in case you need to challenge. Um, so it's not. There's no like proof of stake shenanigans going on here. Um, <laughs> Um, yes, thank you. Uh, good question, Daniel Goldman. Very, um, <laughs> person. Um, um, I think, I think there, there are a couple more. Uh... Yeah, let me, let me, let's see. Um, yeah, I um, mean, I think yeah. the, the important thing to recognize about the challenge mechanism is that it is very unlikely to, it, it's, it's both incredibly critical for the security of the system and incredibly unlikely to ever occur, um, which is a weird combination. Um, in that you want you 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 need people need to be ready to use it, um, but a um, you know the, the you know it should it should not occur because basically there's there's next to no incentive to actually post something invalid, and and b if it does occur there's there's a, the challenge period is weak. But it doesn't take anywhere near a week to actually resolve um, to resolve a challenge. Like in terms of, you don't need to use the full week if you're operating efficiently and you're not being censored. You could do it. You kind of you could do your side much much quicker. And so there's a fair amount of time to kind of coordinate around actually kind of you know if this were to happen in the live chain, there'd be a pretty decent amount of time to kind of coordinate around. Um, kind of forming and participating in the challenge. It's not as though this has to happen kind of like live and dynamically super quickly. Um, you could, you know, have, you don't need to like sit around on with like a full stake in hand, you know, as long as you could, you know, assemble a stake within, you know, a day or two, um, you would still be totally fine. 
Um, so I think that, you know, that kind of context on this is like, is kind of valuable that this is not like something that, you know, will be happening all the time that you need to be ready to jump into at a minute's notice. This is something that kind of is a much rarer and can be, and, you know, potentially significantly kind of more man, you know, high touch, um, sort of, sort of occurrence that the thing yeah. that you want to happen is you want to have people notice that something invalid has been posted. Um, which is, you know, quite, you know, which is quite easy. And you want to, you know, you know, you want to relatively quickly respond, but it's certainly not as though there's kind of like a very short window and a massive rush to do so. Yeah. Um, there's a few related questions I want to get to. One from, uh, I mean, I know it's Angela, so I'm calling you Angela. One from Angela about um, the, uh, basically whether this like interactive thing means that, um, does this system, is, is it part of the trade-off that the, the sort of challenger and the proposer have to stay live longer? Right. And like is essentially does the interactive thing mean that we have to sort of keep stretching it out for each individual step? And an interesting bit of history here is um, if you go back to sort of earlier versions of Arbitrum Protocol, that kind of used to be the case where basically each step um, in the challenge had a given amount of time, um, which meant that, yeah, the more steps that are involved, you know, we can't quite predict how long it's going to take. Um, but we um, since changed things. I think it may have been Stephen who had this this insight. Maybe it was Ed. I don't know. Maybe just some combination of all of you. But um, basically, now the answer is essentially no. Um, the timing for sort of a given dispute, we do have this nice upper bound. Um, and the easiest way to summarize it is it works the way chess clocks do. So each party has a total amount of time, and when it's their turn, their clock ticks. And if your clock runs out, you lose. Um, so this way, in terms of time bounds, we can just basically get essentially get like the same time bound guarantees as as something like single round which is very nice um um good question there, there is definitely kind of a, a an assumption that like you know valid like people who are running validators who are doing this will be running it on you know decent you know you know good good machines with good internet connections um but like the thing the nice thing about optimistic rollups is that you can assume that um because basically you only need one valid note because you only need one honest note and so you don't need to um, you don't need to kind of have anywhere near the degree Ethereum kind of you want to constrain very heavily. You know, you want people to be able to run a node on a, on a Raspberry Pi um, because kind of decentral of the net, decentralization of the network is critical to its security because it's kind of needs to have 51 percent honest, honest nodes. Whereas kind of because Arbitrum doesn't have, because optimistic rollups in general don't have that sort of requirement, it means that you can compromise a bit, a bit more on kind of the, the hardware necessary to kind of efficiently run um, a validator without any sort of decrease in, in security, um, which is kind of very nice. Um, yeah. Um, another question I see, this one from David Haller, um, about essentially the fast asset liquidity providing method, this, um, uh, this like liquidity exit thing, basically like where does this mechanism take place? And the answer to that is like, it, this can be implemented just at the application level. Um, and we already have a few applications that like, um, you know, we have a few applications um, on our test net that are already doing that. So like we have support for connects, there's the, the hop exchange protocol, but basically like, you know, all you need, um, the reason this can happen at the application level is like with something like Connects, you can just do this atomic swap where some party agrees like, hey, if you pay me on L2, I'll pay you on L1. You can just implement that at the ends. Um, we also do have like fast a fast exit thing integrated directly like into our token bridge um, where you sort of like track the withdrawals and then someone can like buy the withdrawal from you in flight. But yeah, there can be, there's all sorts of different ways of implementing this. And this doesn't have to be something like wired into the core protocol, which is kind of nice. Um, um, in terms of the amount of time disputes, take, I think like we're just like following the general. Oh, we lost Harry. Oh well. In terms of the like the amount of time disputes, we're fo like we're following just like, the general community decision, which is probably arbitrary to be honest. But everyone's like going with a week, so we're going with that. Um, and that's like the upper bound how long a dispute can take. Um, uh, yeah. So in other words, like and, you know, uh, I, yeah, two weeks. I was going to say, it's really because there's two parties, the absolute yeah. upper bound. If you have two parties and they're both trying to delay the system, that dispute can take. Uh, yeah, this, this is yeah. like, I can give like a quick summary of this because this is kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah. Basically, like the reason why you, the, optimist, the, the dispute period and the optimistic rollout protocols are as long as they are 
is basically kind of this fear of like a long-term censorship attack against Ethereum. Um, this kind of risk that like is hard to it's hard to really like analyze this risk. Um, it's definitely kind of like you know very much like a, an absolute worst case scenario because if someone were to, for example, censor Ethereum transactions for kind of for a week. There's a lot of damage they could do to like, you know, DeFi, like they could force liquidations, they could block Oracle updates, like there's all sorts of horrible stuff they could do already on Ethereum. Um, and so that's kind of the the kind of context for that. So basically the the way that like the timing works for us and the way that kind of the way to think about this is that like the thing that you want to make sure is that if a censorship attack occurs, there's time for it to be resolved using kind of, you know, a hard fork in order to fix it um, or a soft fork or, you know, we don't need to get into the details, but essentially like, you know, off, you know, real human beings coming together, releasing a new software version that will, that will resolve the issue, let's say. Um, and that's kind of the reason why it's weak is actually for that manual intervention process. So then the question is basically, how do you ensure that if there's a censorship attack, you'll have like that weak window, you'll have that window of a week in order to kind of resolve it. Um, and, and the way and the way that we handle that is basically by kind of, I think the, the good analogy here is a chess clock. Each person, each of the two people in the challenge have a week to do all of the rounds that they're going to do. So you have your week and you're in the, and the other person has their week. In the happy case, kind of the parts of the challenge that you do kind of in total will take minutes. There's kind of very little that you, there's very little time that has to be spent like between seeing what the other person does and then being ready with your response. And so basically the only reason kind of the limit isn't like 20 minutes or a half hour um, is because of this sort of censorship thing. And, and so basically kind of the, what we do there is we say, well, Let's say you start being censored and Ethereum and kind of there's there. So there's some attack on Ethereum. There's like a 51% attack or something and you're being censored. Um, and, and this is going on. And then basically the attack is broken somehow, but it's broken in a way that now you're no longer going to be censored. Um, so then you should be able to finish up the rest of the operations that you have to do in the challenge relatively quickly. Because if there's a week, if there's, a, if there's a, if there's a serious censorship attack, and it's solved, there's not going to be a new one immediately thereafter. If we, if we solve the censorship attack, we're going to solve it for the entire challenge. Um, and so that's kind of where basically this chess talk clock idea comes in, is that we're factoring in like some, at, at some point in the challenge, there could, be a, there could be kind of a censorship attack causing a really long delay. Um, but it's not going to happen multiple times. Um, and, and so that's kind of like why basically the entire challenge um, has two weeks because each party has um, their kind of their week. Um, and, and one kind of interesting thing there is that it's not even a week from when the challenge, it's not even two weeks from when the challenge starts. It's two weeks from when the kind of original node that's being challenged was created. Because basically the reason for that is that when, if an invalid node is posted, anybody, any of any other validator on the network or who's running an arbitrum node will see that that was invalid um and that somebody should at that point post a valid node and so essentially kind of the the week is basically that's essentially a roll-up block that's essentially their the first move in the challenge is is basically kind of posting that contradictory claim um and so if you take a long time to do that you're essentially kind of taking you're you're delaying getting into the challenge um and so that's kind of already eating away basically at your week of time. Now a week is a long time. So it's not as though there's like a huge rush here, but it is kind of when the clock starts counting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then in the, in the sort of happy case, uh, where there's no challenge, it just takes a week for a transaction to finalize, which importantly yeah. means like for a withdrawal, that's, that's when you've executed, which hopefully, hopefully so that answers your question. It's one week, so it's yeah, like sure. one week for the asserter and one week for the challenger. So kind of in basically the worst case there is if the challenger, if, if someone is malicious and kind of manages to challenge themselves, um, then that's kind of where you get to like the two weeks worst case. If kind of one of them is, if one of, if kind of there is a dishonest assertion and an honest challenger, um, then it'll the worst case will be slightly more than one week. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, which again, and yet again, if you're doing that, you're essentially just burning your own money. So, um, um, but yeah, no, as far as, as far as like this, this week long parameter, when I say it's arbitrary, I mean, it's, you know, it's just sort of something the community has kind of converged on as again, like if there were this L1 censorship attack, which of course would just be very bad generally, vaguely speaking, what is the time it takes for like some sort of social consensus to emerge, um, and to do something about that. Um, um, so yeah, I'm just sort of like piggybacking off of that and, you know, veering on the conservative side there. Um, yeah, and just the, the one more question came in, uh, which is, um, if it was, you know, two honest parties that were that were somehow engaged in a dispute, yeah, they could finish it super quickly. I don't know if, like, yeah. I mean, it, it'll be five or six transactions total. So it's basically kind of however, you know, maybe, maybe 10 minutes, but um, there's no sort yeah. of... Exactly. There's um, no reason not to just like do your side of the of the of the interaction right away. So then, yeah. after the challenge is over, you can't confirm the underlying node. There's a, the other thing here is that there is a there is also kind of no node will be confirmed in in less time than a week. Um, since if there's a challenge that's resolved quickly, um, if that we we still you still need to kind of allow time for other challenges to come in, um, and, and so sort of. The, there's a there's a kind of a week the, the week period which is kind of the time that is a, that the node could be challenged is is kind of set in stone there um, regardless of kind of whether or not a challenge has kind of started and finished um, before that week is up. Yeah. Next time maybe we'll just get you on stage, Angela. We have a lot of a lot of specific questions, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, hopefully that kind of clears it up um, um, in terms of. Uh, yeah, in terms of the timing and uh, with this this multi round process, um, I see we're at an hour. Really subtle, and like we, yeah. it, 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 we, we didn't realize that we could do this for a long time. Um, and and you know when we when we figured out that it was possible, because like for a while we had kind of thought basically that you had to provide a sec a, a separate time period for. Um, for stuff. kind of each round of the challenge. And it was really kind of like digging into the details of basically like why you have to assume kind of a, a, a potentially long t censorship time and, and how resolution of that would look like um, that we kind of came to this design where, where you can actually have sort of a week between all of the moves. Yeah, essentially like what is the actual risk you're mitigating? And as you said earlier, once you realize it's this like extended censorship risk, just you know, giving this extended time for a transaction is effectively the same, uh, the same uh, security assumption as um, um, yeah. So like a censorship attack would be very bad for L1 and for L2 regardless, and like this doesn't actually change that or make that any worse. So um, uh, yeah, it's a very nice nice improvement we made. Uh, and again, when I say we, I, it was not my idea. <laughs> um, but essentially, like the the. the the challenges will only like this is these essentially kind of only happen in the malicious case, and so like I think the you know and I'm, I mentioned this you know periodically, but the important thing to highlight here is that like you know this is something something weird and malicious is, is happening if you get into this situation at all, which you know the protocol needs to be able to nicely handle and does, but it's not the sort of thing that will kind of happen in kind of regular functionality. Um, because basically, if it is if it's happening, somebody's committed to losing a large amount of money, um, which is not something that you know somebody will likely do freely. Um, and losing a large amount of money for kind of the only upside to them being they've managed to delay withdrawals for for a week, for some amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. And so, right. kind of the upside yeah. to them is quite low, and the downside is is losing their stake. There you go. So it's very important code that should rarely, if ever, have to run. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, okay. There's yeah more questions. We can keep answering those um, um, in general. Um, but I think it's probably about time to wrap. Um, thank you for all the good questions. Um, appreciate that. Um, good protocol related questions is fun. Um, yeah, and we'll um, we'll post this recording first of all. Um, hopefully, this was um, helpful and interesting. Um, obligatory reminder that we are hiring. Um, uh, and there's all sorts of positions open, so you can reach out to us various ways. Uh, there in the audience is the, probably the first person you'll be speaking to. Um, and yeah, no, thanks for joining. This was fun. Yeah.
These are awesome. Yeah, anything else? Thanks for, uh, thanks for organizing and, and, uh, and, and cloning yourself. Yeah, no, I asked a lot of great questions. Um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> I think you might um, need to like, so do some like return, like fire, you know, fire back some like, uh, you know, change your Twitter name. Uh. Yeah, I'll change my Twitter name or a Discord name to some combination of, um, um, of like Angela or Ben. Um, yeah, that'll be my next step. Um, <laughs> um, all right, cool. Yeah, and we'll be um, we'll be doing more of these. I don't, I don't think we have a next one scheduled yet, but just keep an eye keep an eye out on Twitter and so on. Um, and probably the next one will be something more more open ended Q and A style. Um, Cool. Alrighty. Signing off. Awesome. Thanks, Wes. Thanks for joining.